Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Macabre Matinee with Craig and Sean. Yeah. Yeah, here we are. I believe this is episode four, and I do know that because we're going to review episode four of Friday the 13th, the yep. final chapter. Yep, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make it really easy to, to count the number of episodes through this franchise until they stop dropping the numbers. Then we're going to have yeah. to actually remember. <laughs> For sure. Um, yeah, so we're recording this. Uh, we're recording it. Wow, that was really uh, good wording there, Craig. Uh, words, are, are words are fun this. and tough. <laughs> <laughs> they are, in the middle of a holiday weekend, even. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're recording this uh, the day after Christmas. So to all of you uh, listening to this on Tuesday, happy holidays. Hope you enjoyed your Christmas and have a safe and happy New Year's. Yeah, Sean, you have a good Christmas. I did, I did. With uh, everything yeah. going on, I just we, me and the wife, just chilled at home, exchanged our gifts, and ate tacos. So it was a pretty good That's day. Good. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, as per usual, I am Craig Lance, and I'm Sean Bearded Capulet. And again, thanks for joining us. Uh, this is going to be your weekly spoiler warning segment. Uh, <laughs> We will be discussing this movie in depth. There is no way we can. Uh, there is no way we can review these movies without spoiling them. So if you haven't seen this movie and you don't want to be spoiled, now's your chance. Press pause, go watch it, and then come back and finishing and finish listening to us. Yeah. So, uh, as as I stated earlier, we're reviewing uh, Friday the Thirteenth, the final chapter or part four, depending on. You know, yeah, how the, you want uh, to look at it. The biggest lie in movies. Uh, times. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, the not-so-final chapter. <laughs> yeah, the middle chapter. <laughs> right. Or the first movie in the new trilogy. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, so this one was released in 1984. It was directed by Joseph Zito, written by Barney Cohen and Bruce Sacow. It starred Kimberly Beck as Trish Jarvis. Uh, Corey Feldman, yes, that Corey For- Feldman, <laughs> is Tommy Jarvis. And had another name in here, uh, Crispin Glover. Oh, boy, yeah. He is definitely <laughs> in this film. <laughs> as Jimmy, pretty much playing the same role he played in uh, <laughs> yeah. Back to the Future. Um, and this one is interesting because... In addition to, you know, you always get the throwback scenes. You always kind of have more than one Jason in every movie. Right. But this one actually had two people play Jason throughout the new scenes of the movie. But Tom Savini only played Jason for one scene, if I'm not correct. I believe that's right. If I'm not mistaken. Right. I believe you are correct, which, again, yeah, Tom Savini returning for this film. Yeah. Uh, He he actually. Um, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say Ted White's name as well. Oh, also right, played right. Jason. Uh, just because you mentioned Tom Savini already, I was going to go ahead and point out, uh, he has been uh, quoted since uh, making this, that he actually only returned because, once again, they thought this was going to be the last Friday the 13th, and he returned to kill off his uh, co-creation. You know, so he was yeah, like, I'll well. come, yeah, I'll come back only because this is it, and I want to kill Jason. <laughs> Yeah, so, I think they lied to him. I think we all know how that turned out. <laughs> <laughs> so as we're used to by now, the the pre credit scene is the now familiar recap of the previous movie, except this one does a new thing. It yeah. recaps the entire first three movies of the series. <laughs> Again, Instead given, of, that, uh, given that very much like this is it, I mean, they, they intended this to be the last one. It just didn't turn out like that. <laughs> uh, money speaks louder than intention sometimes so in Hollywood. And so, yeah, this one, uh, as I said, it gives you the uh, recaps and then it jumps right into this amazing 1980s title explosion <laughs> that looks like it could have been out of, uh, oh, Lethal Weapon or something like that. Oh, for uh, sure. <laughs> yeah. But then it goes right into the story, which picks up immediately following part three. So basically you have parts two, three, and four happen within three days of each other. Yeah. Uh, yeah, with a, with a five-year pause between part one and two. So 
it's kind of interesting that they did that. I mean, Jason just went on a rampage for three days. <laughs> oh, and he and, had quite the kill count in three whole days. <laughs> yes, he did. Um, so, yeah, this picks up with the emergency services of Wessex County, New Jersey, busy t- picking up all of the bodies and cataloging evidence. And, of course, the last body they load onto the ambulance is that of Jason. They firmly strap him to the gurney <laughs> and load him into the ambulance and take him to the hospital. Yep. Uh, kind of setting up that whole thing that you think is going to happen where he's going to wake up on the ambulance and kill them, but... Surprisingly enough, he makes it all the way to the hospital, <laughs> and we get the, to meet the uh, creepy coroner Axel, um, who at one point suggests that necrophilia is actually acceptable as long as a young woman is hot enough. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, morticians! <laughs> uh, yep, a, a unique yeah. bunch. <laughs> yep, <laughs> and so. Uh, Axel starts fooling around with this nurse and, uh, you know, Jason's arm drops on top of them in the middle of it, which freaks them out. And she leaves and you think, oh, well, you know, we'll see what happens. And Axel goes ahead and puts Jason into the cooler, but doesn't quite close the door. And here shortly comes Jason to take care of both Axel and the would be, uh, partner nurse. Yeah. Yeah, which, you know, again, I kind of like that they're doing this where they just kind of jump right into giving you some early tension in the movie. Oh, for sure. And that's, uh, that's something we'll definitely be discussing about this movie that did very well. Yeah. So, you know, again, they're, they, they're kind of following following into this formula that, that they've, they've established of starting with some tension giving you some early kills, and then they introduce you to the new characters. Right. And so, yeah, so shortly after him killing these, uh, you know, Axel and the nurse, uh, we meet Trish and Mrs. Jarvis as they're taking a jog around the lake. And they're talking about some kids that are going to rent the cabin next to their house for the weekend. And then we jump to the kids in the car on the way to the house. And... The kids kind of get a little lost or kind of get their bearings, you know, mixed up. And they pull over right next to a cemetery where we finally get to see Mrs. Voorhees' name. Yep. Because we get to see her tombstone. And we learn, I think this is the first time in canon that her name was Pamela. Yep. And as they're pulling off, a hitchhiker comes out and tries to wave them down and they blow her off Well, she sits down to have a banana and we find out that Jason doesn't really like people hanging around his mom's cemetery (laughs) too much. (laughs) That's true. So the kids get to the lake and after getting settled in, they decide they're going to take a walk to crystal point, which I don't know if it's ever addressed later. If crystal point is an attraction or is it a convenience store or whatever? I don't know, but they're, they're headed to Crystal Point. And along the way, they run into the sisters, Tina and Terry, who join up and uh, decide to come to the cabin for a party later that night, conveniently dividing the group into four guys and four girls. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, as Tommy and Trish are now headed back to town, back from town, where Trish has taken Tommy to get a part for his Nintendo so he can play Zaxxon upstairs and quit uh, annoying his mom. Yeah, it's required, uh, really. <laughs> really. Uh, their car breaks down, and uh, 10-year-old Tommy, I'm assuming he's around 10 years old, I don't know why I wrote exactly 10 years old, <laughs> but somewhere around there, is doing his best to fix the car when we have yet one more character show up. And that's Rob, and we quickly learn that Rob is hunting Jason. We understand that as the audience, but I'm not quite so sure that uh, Tommy and Trish understand that yet. Right. Uh, and later on, we underst- we learn that uh, he's hunting Jason because Jason killed his sister at one point in the past. So apparently, you know, other than what happens in the movies, Jason's been killing other people as well. Yeah. Uh, 
So soon night rolls around and the eight partying kids start to drink and dance and generally just making bad decisions. <laughs> soon the, the party starts spilling, uh, splitting off into pairs, which is never a good idea. In it's a the Jason best movie. idea in a horror movie, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and so they start splitting off into pairs and then Jason starts doing his thing. <laughs> Before long, all that's left is Tommy, Rob, and Trish Rob and Trish leave Tommy at the house as they go to check on the kids at the party, soon finding out that Jason has been there and done lots of damage. He quickly takes out Rob, and Trish runs home to Tommy. After realizing they can't stop Jason, Trish tries to distract him so that Tommy can get away. She runs off to the neighboring cabin, leading Jason with her uh, away with her but Tommy has other ideas and decides to cut his hair and make himself look as much like young Jason as he can. Trish takes some uh, damage, but manages to escape from Jason. When she gets that back home, she's very upset that Tommy hasn't left. Jason comes through the front door attacking again, but Tommy looking a bit like young Jason begins talking to Jason and distracting him. Jason, not being the most stable of beings, pauses long enough for Trish to hit him in the head with a machete, knocking the mask off and revealing an all-new Jason face. As it, per almost every movie. <laughs> <laughs> A different look. And Tommy picks up the machete and does some massive damage to Jason. So, yeah, that's pretty much where the movie ends. There's another scene or so in there. and I didn't go into all the kills and all of that. But, right. Uh, and this uh, this was one of my favorites. Oh, it it uh, is amongst the fans. It's definitely a favorite. It like as we're going through these, we'll see if anything changes. But right now, I think this is my favorite one. Yeah, it's certainly my favorite out of the first four. Um, I really enjoyed kind of the ending of it. You see Tommy losing his mind, which right. is a setup for spoiler warning for a future movie. Right. Yeah, the uh, the implication of like and like they of a and they kind of do it a few times throughout the next few movies of a like is someone else gonna take the mantle, you know? Because again, this was supposed to be the death of Jason, and it technically is. And we'll get into more of that later in the other movies. But uh, yeah, the, right. uh, the the Tommy looking straight to the camera, you know, looking like man is. I mean, because really, like so he did massive damage to Jason, which will get into some detail here soon, but like, then it was just like, he didn't quite finish him. Cause you see the hand twitch and Tommy noticed that. And he just took that machete and just says hacking and hacking away. And just screaming, die, die. So yeah. they really well, wanted this, to. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, okay. Sean, but it really leads me into, I think, I mean, Jason has to be considered supernatural by this movie. He may not be zombie Jason yet. Right. But, I mean, he, he came back from the dead to start the movie. <laughs> they, uh, I mean, they don't put you in the uh, cooling room if they haven't checked your vitals. Right. So either he's got the ability to shut down all of his vitals <laughs> or, you know, he, he straight up comes back from that axe to the face in the first, uh, or in the last movie, and then... And this one, as you said, you know, he Tommy does some serious damage with his first blow of the machete to him. Yeah. Now, like I said, in the greater, in, in, in the overall canon of Friday the 13th, much like some, a lot of these horror movies, especially at this time, that had sequels, like even like Halloween, with the first one, uh, Michael Myers, did he take like a, 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 a hanger to the eye? He definitely got shot in the chest a couple times flying over that, falling off a, second floor of the house yep it's, a, it's just one of those kind of like well they're just too tough to die or too crazy to die i guess uh, maybe but i it, it, it's pushing the limit of that belief even that little bit of believability you know that your suspension of disbelief because jason has taken some hellified damage i mean the fact that uh like you said when tommy hit him he hits him in the square in the side of the head which a this a shout out to the special effects of seeing Jason slide down the machete with it it lodged into his eye or into the side of his yep. head, and then yep. he's still twitching 
which is what triggered Tommy to start hacking and just hacking away. We never see the full damage, but he, cause he, they show it off. It's off camera, but he's just, he's fucking Jason up. And he, at that point, Jason is dead, even in the wide canon of the, of the series. Yeah. But, uh, but this one, like, this is just a standout. Tom Sabine came back. And even though a lot of it still, uh, as per usual, the censors just wanted to cut up these movies as much as they can. This one is definitely one of the gorier films in the franchise at this point. And, uh, I mean, just they brought back Savini, who's just a master of that, those practical effects, and even made uh, Tommy Jarvis, uh, how he likes to create masks. And this kind of thing was a complete tribute to, uh, to Savini being in the movie. That's right. Knowing that now versus when I watched it, you know, as a kid. Right. It, it certainly changes it because you do understand that it is a nod to Savini. Oh, oh, totally. But it's also it's also a setup for for Tommy to be able to make himself look a little bit like uh, a young Jason. Yeah, to mess well, with Jason. Yeah, after finding the the newspaper clip that that uh, one guy was hunting him down had all that evidence, he saw a picture of what Jason was supposed to look like as a kid and modeled himself after that. Yeah, and so, I mean, he did the best he could. He couldn't really yeah. get the deformities and stuff in there in that period of time, but he gave himself some eye black and. Yeah, and shaved his hair. Off. Yeah, shaved most of his head off. His hair off. But uh, in, in, go ahead. Oh yeah, but just like showing like the creativity with Tommy and a shout out to Trish, his sister. Just like talk that one of the few, especially around this time, where you really see a fem a female character in these movies fighting back. Like I said, as she distracted she Jason, and like I mean, I put up a clip in the rotation of the images y'all are seeing during this video. Like, I mean, she's taking swings at Jason with the machete. Like she's really trying to fight. Like she's scared, but it's that protecting the family thing where you don't always get the whole like having to protect a kid in these type of movies, which I think really made that final scene just really more impactful than some of the others. Well, and. Again, you know, go back to what I said in my breakdown, you know, she, she's doing all of that because she's trying to give Tommy a chance to get away. Yeah. Yeah. And she knows she can't make another run at Jason. She's, right. she's beat up. She's barely able to walk. She's limping as it is. She's thrown herself out of second story window and she gets back home and Tommy's still there. And of course it's just, you know, heart wrenching to her because she knows there's nothing left for her to get at that point. Oh, absolutely. She had pretty much planned on dying at that point. She thought she was going to come back. Jason was going to kill her, but at least Tommy would have got away. Oh, for sure. For sure. And again, that's some good character writing. Something like you don't usually associate with slasher movies of this era, especially. Even now, I would say, you know, it's like it, it was a really good, really good, like fam well written family. You know what I mean? With them. I agree. Yeah, their mom was. Uh integral in the in the storytelling and building this up and uh, you know she she gets her own kind of off camera right but uh yeah you know having crispin glover and Corey feldman in this really in my opinion up the acting uh, to a yeah. new level for the franchise yeah um uh, Crispin I Glover mean, definitely, yeah, being uh, what he okay. Well, we'll, we'll talk more about. It. I'm gonna I'm gonna get on Crispin Glover in a second, but <laughs> yeah, but but no, for sure he's over uh, the top. Crispin Glover's over the top in this movie, but Crispin Glover's over the top in every movie. It's true, it's true. But like, yeah, Corey Feldman definitely because by this point he'd already been in like Goonies and like Gremlins. I think because he was younger in Gremlins, so like you know he's already become like the child actor. You know, so like that's right. So he had, uh, you know, so he brings in a good, some acting chops in this film, as does Crispin Glover. But, and it's, I mean, Crispin Glover, they're definitely the infamous dance scene, you know, that we all know about. Yeah. I've also, I also oh got in the rotation yeah. imagery of this. I got, I found yeah. a good gif of it. Uh, by all reports, that's just how he danced, like in the clubs in the 80s, because most likely. Really? Jokes. Yeah, that, that's just how he dances. <laughs> and that's just, hilarious. Uh, they just, they let, just went with yeah, it. Huh? They just let him go to town, have fun with it, and uh, but my God, like, and I know it's not his fault. He acted his part, and he acted as I'm sure by this point they were like, man, you know, just do you. You're we brought you in to be Crispin Glover, and right. my God, the whole dead fuck, and they're saying you're a dead fuck. That's why your girlfriend left you. Just whining yeah. about it the entire fucking movie. Like I don't, and then like he hooks up with one of the twins, and it's supposed to be. 
I guess you're supposed to care <laughs> about this dude. I'm like, <laughs> I'm just waiting for his time and we get it. And it's so well done. <laughs> it it yeah, is like it, my only, if he was just the annoying whiny fuck the entire time without them trying to, obviously by the time he got laid, uh, make us care. I probably wouldn't be as mad about his character. Nothing against Chris McGovern himself, but like, I don't know that, that character, tr- like out of all the other annoying ones that, other annoying characters that are going to be throughout this franchise. Rarely do I remember them like making you try to care about them. They they kind of knew, but they they tried to give this dude a character arc, and his character was not worth it. <laughs> you know what I mean? His character was not worth it, but <laughs> you know, he but, he got his. Jason took care of that whole group, right? And know, this without, Jason without much problem. Oh no, no, and this Jason especially. Uh, he said Ted White. Uh, little little facts for you. Uh, oldest Jason ever. He was uh, fifty eight oh, yeah. at the time of filming. And uh, second tallest at six foot four. Uh, so, you know, it's a big, intimidating dude who apparently yeah. did not get along with hardly anybody on the set. <laughs> he, um, him and the director constantly butted heads. He actually butted heads with Tom Savini until he realized who Savini was. <laughs> really? And apparently he absolutely despised Corey Feldman. He said he was a spoiled little annoying little shit and that he looked forward to tormenting as much as he could on the set. Uh, that is that's pretty crazy, and it maybe explains why it's so hard to find him credited as yeah. being Jason in this movie. Oh yeah, um, I believe even in the credits it said he because he said don't put my name on it. He was like I think I think Jason just says himself or something. It's uh, like I don't think his name's actually in it on the actual movie credits itself or something to that extent because he. He thought, yeah, he's yeah. not credited for this movie. You have to kind of do some searching to find out who played Jason in this right. movie. Yeah, with, again, the whole little, like, not liking Feldman. There, that sequence where Jason busts through the window and grabs him. Yeah. He, he actually came in early than Q. Or, no, late. He actually <laughs> he, he delayed it late so Feldman would drop his guard and be like, oh, are we not? And then he got it because that was an authentic scream. He scared the shit out of him. <laughs> <laughs> Because apparently, hey. and it's his reports. I don't. I haven't heard anyone else ever talk about it. He just, yeah, he said Feldman was a nightmare on the set. Unfortunately, <laughs> I mean, it's hard to say. Kids are kids, and yeah. this is certainly a uh, a level of uh, movie that you don't expect a ten year old or twelve year old to necessarily uh, be in a, at this time. I mean, today's oh, day and age, sure. you you have kids in these movies, but yeah. And I thought, like I said, Kelman. Uh, Feldman <laughs> did a great job, uh, you know, playing, you know, like a likable kid, like from the mast and playing the video games to, let's be honest, if any 10 year old us was sit, trying to go to bed, look out our window and start seeing a couple making out, <laughs> you know, and the, ex- the little excitement of him just like losing his shit. I mean, I feel, yeah. I felt that, you know what I mean? Like my, well, if I was that age and seeing that, I'd be excited too. <laughs> well, he certainly brought, as you said, a name to the movies, yeah. um, I don't know if Crispin Glover had been in anything at, at this point yet. I think some um, smaller roles. I don't think like I think this predates. Yeah, Back nothing to the you would know him from. I guess is more accurate. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and uh, uh, Kimberly Beck was great as Trish. Yeah, she, she went on to do some other things in in life as well. Uh, but again, I felt like they they upped the acting in this one certainly better than part three. Oh, absolutely! No, no, for but, sure. You know that didn't take a whole lot. Uh, the suspense. <laughs> um, this to me is maybe the most suspenseful of the four movies. Oh, uh, I definitely agree with that. Well, part one had kind of like the mystery, right? Uh, helping it out with the suspense because you know, especially the first time you ever watch it, you don't know the formula yet. So it had good mystery and good tension about it. And part two had it as well. But like by the time this thing starts becoming formulaic by part three, and even here you're kind of expecting the formula. But I think they really did well as far as, like you said, making that tension, making a, even though if it is, you know, hey, he's just going to be chopping through these kids. I said more so with with the uh, Jarvis family. You know, you really felt that a lot more with them, I, I feel. Well, that was something that they didn't do in part three that they went back to in this one, which was make you. 
uh, care about some of the characters. No, absolutely. They weren't worried about it, the 3D gimmick the entire time. <laughs> yeah, you know, the second movie, you cared about the characters. Yeah. And then the third movie, it was like, eh, you know, whatever. They didn't spend really <laughs> enough time, you yeah. know. And then in the third or fourth movie, you're back to, you know, the Jarvis family you really do care about. Not so much the teenage partying, but, you know, this is just a family that lives out there minding their own business. Right. And, uh, and end up in the middle of it because some uh, teenagers wanted to have a, a party next door. Yeah, it really is. They they were definitely unintentionally drawn into Jason's massacre. And That's uh, right. also stopped it at the same time. Uh, funny right, little thing you too. Uh, you mentioned we go back to rewind back to Axel in the uh, in the morgue, yeah, and uh, trying to hook up with the nurse. Uh, at one point, he is enjoying a certain video. If you know the '80s, yeah. you might be familiar with these, uh, or at least heard about aerobics. These aerobics, quote unquote. I forget the I forgot to write down the name of it. I had actually looked it up, but it was a series of aerobic workouts that were directed <laughs> by a porn director. <laughs> so oh, were, yeah. While obviously for those who don't know about these, nothing show nothing sexual. There is a workout or '80s aerobic video, but it's shot in certain ways that are you could just like okay, you hear it's a porn director, and you're like okay, that makes sense. <laughs> but uh, fe- uh, featured in those videos is uh, Darcy Demoss, who uh, you and me, you and I have both met in person at our buddy uh, Larry's conventions. Uh, oh, wow. I did not realize that. Yeah. Uh, and she will go on to uh, be in Friday the 13th Part 6, actually. But she okay. was actually one of the uh, aerobic work, <laughs> aerobic women in that video he was watching. I thought that was pretty neat. That I is never, pretty neat. <laughs> yeah, never realized that in the past. But this film has, like I said, not only did they up the tension and I think the quality of it, this is... I, this is the most nudity and gore of the series up to this point. Like, uh, I mean, yeah. they had the whole skinny dipping scene, like, hey, they're just letting it all hang out <laughs> and they're having a good old time. And, but like on top of that, which, you know, is always good. We always have fun with those, but like the kills, the gore, as even though a lot of it did end up getting cut out, this one had the most shown on film, you know, of the franchise at this point. And uh, while I don't, um, I'm still kind of narrowing down my kill of the movie. Uh, I did have some honorable yeah. mentionings, as we mentioned okay. earlier. The, uh, the the Jason getting uh, sliding down the machete. I can't call it my kill of the movie because he didn't die technically from that one. <laughs> but you, see the graphic detail of just seeing it go into his head and then just sliding down the Savini yeah. at his at his top. Oh, and, for sure. But like, and again, kind of going back to. Uh, um, the, uh, Trish fighting back. I believe it was Trish where she, uh, this like, like, uh, slammed a TV on Jason's head. Yeah. <laughs> that, was the fight. that was pretty great. Too. It's like her getting down. You know what I mean? Like, especially back in this time, you didn't see as much of a, while well, you may have the surviving, uh, female character. They're usually running and scream with well, the occasional, they fight back occasionally. Like, you know, in the first one, you know, hell, she cut off panel of Voorhees' head, but you know, you're right. kind of like. You don't expect it. And for this one especially stood out to me like I'm really enjoying her fighting back as you can say, like delaying, trying to let Tommy get away. So like, I really wanted to mention those as like nice little standouts. But uh Well and, and yeah. I'm, if I'm not mistaken, she also hit him in his hand with the machete, right? And she, split his hand almost. She did in half. Do that. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah which, I, uh, I couldn't remember if that was Trish or not, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, she was, really did some damage to him. Oh yeah, she fought back. I think she actually got a couple of his fingers too. <laughs> it, yeah, I mean they maybe came off. It was certainly like split right between your yeah. ring finger and your middle finger. Right. Oh yeah, yeah. So Jason, like he took some damage, which finally did eventually put him down. But right. um, so I'm still trying to decide. I got I got a couple of things left. I'm trying to, or I got a few left. What What's your kill of the movie? We'll see if we. we if it's one of them, we may agree with you. What uh, What was your kill of the I, movie? For my my kill of the week, I'm going to take Paul, who mm-hmm. was a complete and total douchebag in this movie, taking a <laughs> spear gun to his dick. <laughs> I did have that. Not only to the dick, he lifted his ass, he stabbed him in the dick, <laughs> lifted him up, and then pulled the trigger. <laughs> yep. Which, yeah. It was no. a pretty great kill. So that was my kill of the week. Ma- uh, mainly because of Paul's character. In this right. movie, 
And then, you know, for him to take it where he took it, it was fantastic. So. <laughs> I, ha- I had that written down as one of the possibles. Uh, another one, uh, but you know what? I think I'm going to go with my first one I wrote down. Okay. Which was Axel. Like, not okay. only did Jason take the uh, hacksaw and slice his throat, then he just twisted his head completely around and off. <laughs> it was a pretty fantastic kill, for sure. I mean, and that's how they opened the movie. The only other one I had mentioned was purely because, like what you said about Paul, was Crispin Glover getting a wine cork to the hand and then a meat cleaver to the <laughs> face, which was great, but mainly because it was Crispin Glover's character getting it. Well, and then he got uh, uh, kind of, I would say, crucified on the door. He did. Oh, that, that's right. That was him, wasn't it? Yeah, and then uh, Jason needing to get through the door later just pushes through him and you see his hands <laughs> rip away from the spikes. It was pretty right. great. Oh, yeah. I mean, there was some brutal stuff. And, I mean, also the one, like, it didn't really, as far as, like, it wasn't super violent and maybe made me chuckle a bit more than I should have. But remember, I forget which one of the girls, but Jason just grabbed one of the girls and just chunked her out the window. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just yeah, super casually. Twins. Yeah. yeah. Like, super casually. Like, there are some <laughs> great kills in this film, which, you know, we all have to admit that it's, it's a big appeal for slasher films. You know, on some level, we enjoy seeing, especially the more annoying teenagers get it. I would say the, the, the one that deserved it the least was the hitchhiker. She just wanted to get... What'd you say? It was like Nevada or love on one side of her sign. <laughs> yeah. Then when they honked and like made well, some fat joke at her, she flipped around and said, fuck you, which was great. Yeah. And the, I think she just got off because she just happened to be sitting at the wrong cemetery. Yeah. That was just bad luck. Like, and she's yeah. trying to enjoy her banana and got stabbed in the back of the head. <laughs> I, I do want to talk a little bit about the score in this movie. Sure. Sure. I've, yeah, I feel like they went back to a little bit more music in this than they had in the last one. Right. But again, it was still kind of minimal mm-hmm. to give you that feel of, you know, hey, you're out in the woods, things are quiet. Yeah. Oh, uh, no, yeah, for sure. But it worked perfectly for building the tension in this movie. Yeah. So. And, and uh, again, like, without, like I said, rem- this is, like, probably the first time I've ever, like, really watched these films analyzing it, you know, analytically, if that's a word. <laughs> but, it, it is, yeah. Uh, you know, so, like, yeah, paying attention to little things like that, it, you're absolutely right, just building the atmosphere up with the, with the quiet. You know, in the future films, which he kind of goes around a little more civilization, I'm pretty sure, like, music kind of plays a bit more, which makes sense, whether it was intentional or not. It is something this franchise up to this point really had done, is making you feel, like, alone, like, and without any kind of music where it's just, the silence of the woods or the, you know, the tension, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well done. Well, so, so in a lot of movies, in most movies you watch, there's a constant score going on. You just don't realize it. There's, there's constantly music in the background, but it's played at a low level and you don't realize it. What you do notice in this movie and in this, this series up to this point is like I said, the lack of score, right? In my, until they need it, and when they need it, it's just about perfect for the tension. Yeah, because uh, so. like when it does kick in, it's usually a slow build up as it, you know, very much climax into the appearance of Jason or the appearance of a kill at least. You know, used often like that, not used as the simple like the jump scares that are. No more prevalent today, where it's just a sudden burst of music or a burst of sound, just to make the audience jump. Often with fake outs, right? But, uh, yeah, not so much in the case of these films. And I do want to say um, that Gordon the dog, uh, <laughs> yes. we do not see if he lives or not, but I feel like he did. He jumped out the window, and we never saw him again. Oh, yeah, he yeeted the fuck out of there, as some kids like to say these days. Uh, <laughs> as they say in modern vernacular. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Gordon is the smartest animal in the history of movies. <laughs> yeah, he, he got the fuck out. He yeah. jumped out the window. You hear him yelp. Yeah. And then you see him jump out the window, and you never see him again. So you're, yeah, he, you're he right. was not messing around with Jason. <laughs> He's a, he, he said, nope. <laughs> He's like, there is a dude with a weapon trying to kill me and i'm out of here <laughs> no absolutely and yeah that's uh like i said this is a definitely my favorite one so far in going back 
And uh, yeah. to my memory of the others, without you know, I said I haven't watched them in a little while. It's probably going to be tough to fight that to uh, to top this one. I I agree, and we'll give our stream rating here in a minute. Let me give the kill count first. Right. We had uh, thirteen kills by Jason, Ooh. and one by Tommy. <laughs> Very true. So, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, like once again, kill counts up for this movie. And I, I went and did a little research and just a little preview for you guys. It keeps going up. <laughs> well, you always got to, you always got to top the previous installment in one way, shape or form. Whether well, I think it, the, the difference on this one is I think it had the same amount or close to the same amount of kills as the last movie. Right. But you see more of them on screen. Yeah. Definitely, like by this point, yeah. they they mastered. Uh, cause I, I'm, if I remember right, read, from reading the uh, you know the the tales of uh, Camp Crystal Lake book, like as they went on, because he had a lot of the same producers, even though directors and writers changed. But like by the time the editing team at this time, they're like we kind of know, like they would actually. Uh, I think they did it a little dirty, if I remember correctly. They would kind of send a more cut version of the film to the to the rating board. <laughs> And they would give it the R well, rating. And then, I mean, and not like extreme changes, but they would actually put in a few more seconds. <laughs> I think they had to kind of learn well, what they had to do. We'll, we'll go over this um, when we get to the Psycho movies at some oh. point in the future. Okay. But, you know, back when the first Psycho came out, there wasn't a rating system. It was just either approved or it was not approved. Right. And the shower scene got denied, I want to say, two or three times Oh, before it was finally approved, and he never made a change once in it. He would just send it back in. <laughs> so I guess to uh, I guess put in, like, I, uh, that kind of just makes me think uh, we're going we're gonna to throw a little uh, Southern Fry Geekery kind of talk here. Uh, for the people that send in your, uh, get your comics graded, I guess it depends on the grader. Sometimes you get the different scores. <laughs> like he, or like, or he just wore them down, you know. Oh, just, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, enough's <laughs> enough. <laughs> right, they're like, fine, let them let them have the syrup in the shower, whatever. We don't care anymore. <laughs> we don't want to watch this film again. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I would say that uh, this one is about as close to macabre uh, cinematic perfection as you can get for a horror movie yeah um i graded it a 4.75 which is kind of cheating <laughs> but i wanted it higher right i wanted it higher than uh part two for me you know uh so, it's a fair point like up until this i was like well you know is anything a perfect five and but and that's kind of right. like me being a movie reviewer you know i kind of think in the broad spectrum but and looking at horror movies, great on that curve, and especially if it's given us time, I'm gonna give it the five star. Okay. I All think right. this is. I think this is one. If you don't, even if you don't know the history, although you get a great brief history lesson in the beginning of this film, I think if you were just to pick a random Friday the Thirteenth movie to show someone, you would show them this one. I think that's fair. Yeah. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and give it the full five. I had four and a half written down. Fuck it, I'm giving it a five. Well, there you go. It, and, you know, it came, It comes down to I don't want to re-rate my other movies because I don't think that's fair. Right, right. I think you rate them as you watch them. But I did feel like it was uh, better than two, which was my favorite up to this point. Yeah. Uh, yeah definitely. So, you know, I went with the 4.75, and uh, we'll see where that puts it at the end of the rating. But that's going to be pretty hard to beat. With 9.75 screens, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, again, at the end of this, we'll tell you what our favorite, we'll give you our breakdown. Oh, of course. Yeah, so uh, good times, good movie, a lot of fun to rewatch. I highly recommend this to people. Uh, yeah. Again, uh, even if, as you said, if you haven't watched any of the others, you can jump right in on this one and especially for 80s horror movies, it really is a top of the line. No, for sure. And, like, I mean, on top of, like, you know, 80s horror to even the, um, 
like I said, the series itself, you know what I mean? It's a, uh, it's just, I think it's a big standout in a franchise that I love. Cause I think like when we, I may have said it early on when we were first talking about like ranking them, I always said it was hard for me because I love the entire franchise. And I like I messaged you going, remember when I said I, I can't pick a favorite because I uh, I love right. the entirety? I think I'm a liar because <laughs> <laughs> rewatching this, I mean, yeah, it's it's definitely a five for me because it, it's just so damn good. You can't argue with that at all. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's just this week's review. Unless you've got anything else to add, buddy. No, I think we actually covered it pretty good. As much as we, uh, you know, we both love this film. I mean, it's just kind of <laughs> going back and forth. It's, yeah, it's, it's this is so damn good. This is, you know, slasher movie. In my view, damn near perfection. I mean, like I, like you said, I, I didn't want to go the four point seven five route. <laughs> so <laughs> I went ahead and give it that final, like you know, I mean, for us older people, you know, remember Star Search when we get all into the little fractions of rating it. So right. I'm a, I went ahead and just bumped it. Like, yeah, it's definitely a five for me. So this one I would highly, highly recommend. And uh, speaking of recommendations, I believe it's my turn. <laughs> I actually don't remember, but I'm going to go ahead and go anyway. For a, a horror movie recommendation, uh, that's going to be um, the uh, ABCs of Death. If y'all haven't heard of this one, it's a uh, an anthology series. That's hello. Trying to get back into Discord. Gonna have to send this to Craig. Hello? Can you hear me? I can. I got disconnected, brother. We're gonna have to edit this down. I don't know when you stopped hearing me. I stopped hearing you yeah, a while ago. <clears throat> yeah, me either. So, um, it disconnected both of us is what happened. Oh, so, Joy. Do you remember uh, when's the last time you heard me? <laughs> uh, you were talking about it just being a great movie and not wanting to break it down into partial fractions oh, okay um just uh, let's uh let's just kind of record hello hello oh boy and then uh are you there i, I lost you for a second now we're connected again i don't know why it's Fucking yeah, up. I don't know what's going on either. So, um, and I've got the sniffles all of a sudden too. So, <laughs> you just want me to do my recommendation? We'll just piece it together the best you can. Yep. Let me, uh, yeah, come back in and I'll say, I'll just say, okay, well, Sean, you got a recommendation and then we'll go, uh, to there and you can do the ending and we'll call it good. Okay. Let's, uh, go ahead and count. Uh, I guess we'll just say we'll just get started here in three, two, one, go. Well, good times. Uh, again, go out and watch this one if you haven't. And uh, Sean, you got a recommendation for our crew out there listening to us? <laughs> I do, in fact. Uh, this one is called The ABCs of Death. It's an anthology series. Uh, last, it used to be on Netflix. I don't know if it still is. But if you can find it, I highly recommend it. It is a bunch of short horror stories from many directors from all over the world, each taking one word from each, each letter that they got from the alphabet and making a short uh, horror film themed around whatever word they chose for whatever letter they were given. It's weird. Okay. It's violent. It's awesome. Check it out if you can find it. Awesome. I may have to watch that. I've never, you know, I've heard about it plenty, but never gotten around to watching it. So I need to do that at some point. Oh, so good. A lot of, I mean, some of them are straight up just like perfect little horror stories. Some of them will weird you out, but you know, you get all kind of good and bad in it. <laughs> well, anytime you have an anthology series, you kind of have that going on. So yeah, absolutely. All right. All well, right. That's going to do yeah. it. We want to thank all y'all for listening we appreciate uh, you checking us out. And if you liked what you heard, 
give us a like, give us a comment. Let us know what you thought about this film. You know, if, uh, if you enjoyed it as much as me and Craig did, and, uh, as always share the videos, spread the word, let your friends know that me and Craig are doing some cool horror shit on this web, on this, uh, YouTube page. Absolutely. Uh, share us, enjoy us and, uh, have a good week. We'll talk to you guys in the new year. All right. We'll catch y'all later.